This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I'll be speaking to you. I'll, I'll only speak for about 10 15 minutes. The thing, thing that I've given myself is what, what should Marxist writing about sport, what should it do? What, what are the tasks it should set itself in the present day? Um, and it, it's sort of minded by just two starting thoughts, and they all relate to the thought that essentially a collection of this sort is quite unusual. Um, there have been innumerable Marxist collections of what we all thought about the English Revolution or the concept of revolutions or about capitalism or about whatever. But I don't know of any other book which quite does what this book tries to do, which is collect a lot of different Marxists writing all about sport at exactly the same time. The other thing, of course, is that um, it's not just a change from how Marx, what Marxists have done. Um, generally, we've not written that much about sport compared to other topics we could have written about. It's also a change within the um, format of the sporting anthology. Um, I'm sure lots of people in this room have either in their home book collection or in someone else's home book collection have been there going through sort of great articles from the history of wisdom or, or something of that sort. And you've seen that there, there is a there is definitely um, the literary genre of the sporting collection and generally what holds them together uh, are great performances um, sports journalists memories and anecdotes about great cup finals um, great um, um, innings, whatever and, and of great individuals that, that's the material of the sporting um, collection now obviously it's not um, likely to be the, mater- the material of this. It isn't the material of this. Um, and it, so it's worth thinking, well, why not? And what, what is for me to contribute? What is it I wanted to see in it? Not, not, not just for my own writing, but in the other writings in the book. And the, the starting point, I suppose, is, is that um, within the last 10 years, the way generally people have written about sport has been transformed. It's not just a matter of these, the old dusty sporting collections I've all, all, already alluded to, but, but if you just go through the ordinary experience of turning open um, an ordinary newspaper on an on the average day of the week, firstly, the sheer volume of sports coverage has increased enormously. Secondly, the range of topics covered by sports journalists has increased enormously. Not particularly the number of sports. If anything, there's been a slight constriction in terms of the number of sports covered. But, for example, um, it's not my memory that on an average day in the um, late 1970s or early 1980s that you would get in the sun or the mirror 15 pages of sports reports. There hadn't been any football matches for two days. So so there's there's been this sort of task of, of, of recruiting more and more journalists to write more and more, frankly, non-stories about things which are which are getting further and further away from sports performance. And at the kind of posh end of sports writing, there's been a really interesting phenomenon, I think, of how, um, in a sense, genres which are seen as very middle class and completely alien to the experience of sport, and suddenly within them, sport has gone into them. And you see in terms of... Um, um, it all goes back, I suppose, to the book um, Fever Pitch. But the, the really extraordinary example, I think, this year is, is um, David Peace's novel um, Red or Dead. And for people who don't know it, David Peace is essentially, uh, if not um, this country's foremost novelist, which I think is a pretty decent claim for that, is certainly um, I'm not, a foremost modernist novelist. He's the person who, in 2013, more than anyone else, is trying to take on the kind of revolution of form in literature that goes back to the 1920s, writers like Dos Passos, etc., etc., etc. Now, what, what does he choose for a um, topic of his latest book, The Life of Bill Shankly? And it's not even his first sporting book. This, the first one was actually um, The Damned United, which was a very successful film, no doubt. That's some of the reason why he chose the topic. But you have um, the extraordinary <coughs> collision of, of this sort of modernist form, which takes as its which is always taken as its kind of underlying archaeology. Um, such experiences as, as film, um, Dos Passos as USA, it was all about um, the length of a shot could only be seven or eight minutes. So you wanted to have, um, to recreate the experience of early cinema in the form of a huge novel about the totality of life. Um, Peace does that, 
um, around, the, around the story, the biography of a manager, one of the most successful managers in Italy of the 20th century. But again, it's not something which I think would have been even <coughs> conceivable 20 or 30 years ago. Sport's gone to places um, in terms of consciousness, including literary consciousness, it could never have got to before. Another kind of writing, I think this is perhaps more interesting for our purposes, um, has been the phenomenon of um, a sort of not Marxist, but Marx-ish um, way of writing about sport in the sense of the absolute assumption that the, if you want to understand sporting success, there's absolutely no point whatsoever looking at the individual performances, but taking, say, the philosophy of sort of second international Marxist, Marxism, sort of Placarno's role of the individual in history, what role does the individual in history, in, in reality, if you read the pamphlet, the suggestion is almost none. It's all about big and personal forces. We see sports journalism which starts with that same um, sense of determinism and sense of um, economism. So you get writers like, for example, um, Simon Cooper in the Financial Times and, and, and in various books. David Cohn now has a, has a full-time job at The Guardian. His sole purpose in that job is to study the company accounts of various sporting entities, primarily the premiership football clubs. And you also see that method cascading down um, to a series of local football fanzines and, and to blogs. Um, my favourite football blog that I read more than any other is, is a blog called the Tompkins Times, which is all it is. It, it's, it's this kind of cross between a nerdy financial times reader and a sports enthusiast. And what, what enthuses him more than anything, he, he manages to generate, he's got a team of people writing, so you're talking about four or five articles a day, primarily about just one club, um, Liverpool Football Club, but actually about the whole premiership, talking in the most detailed econometric way and statistical way about things like, for example, um, the proportion um, of teams' budgets, which are being spent on wages as a proportion. We all know generally as experienced as trade union activists and so on. In most businesses, it's very unusual for the proportion of the total spend of a business to be above 50 or 60%. If you go to Manchester City, for example, currently of its total annual income, Income, 110% is spent on wages. And, and drawing um, deep-rooted predictions about long-term futures of different football clubs, how Spurs will do, because they do relatively well on that indicator, who's going to do badly, and so on. And there's this whole um, um, genre, which again, <coughs> didn't exist five years ago in any meaningful sense, let alone 20 or 30. So a question is just why is this happening? Why is it that you're getting more sports writing, which in a sense isn't about sport? It's about the business of sport, or it's about the emotionality of sport, but it's not about the kind of glorified match report, which was this, the, the main bread and butter of sports writing when we all um, first started reading about it. Um, two explanations to my mind. Firstly, is that an awful lot of sport these days is really, really boring. Um, <laughs> And I'll just defend that, I'll defend that argument to the death. Um, what we see is with the creation of, um, of new sporting competitions which have no basis in history or in region. And the classic example would be, say, the, the invention of 2020 cricket. You had to invent teams, you had to choose players to go for the teams. Um, what starts is the business model and the sporting um, competition is structured around it. Or, of course, you could talk about the formula if you want to go back to football. And I, I will be constantly through this going back to football, I'm sorry. I know I suspect many people in the room hate the way in which sport is always reduced to football. But, but if you look at all the way around Europe, um, there seems to be the phenomenon where leagues which, um, again, 30 or 40 years ago, 8, 10 clubs could regularly compete win, with a real chance of winning, where it was possible to go relatively quickly from being a second tier but up and coming club to be challenging and we can all think of examples from 30 years ago when, that's, when that happened. It's not just in Britain that we've seen this constriction where um, sort of satellite competitions such as the Champions League have led to a, a, an over-financing and, and um, capitalisation of the top clubs. So that all sorts of competition, it may be that the competition between 1 and 2 is still exciting, but the competition between 8 and 20 is no longer exciting. It's got really boring. 
and because, because too much money is all about reinforcing the clubs, um, not necessarily the very top, but around the top. And you can, look at, you can look at Spain, you can look at Germany, you can look at most of the leagues around Europe, and you'll see this same process of clubs detaching themselves. Even in Scotland, of course, it used to be the big two, and now it's only the big one. Um, so sport has got duller, and at the same time, the way we look at sport, where we look at it from, has got further and further away. It is vastly more difficult to buy tickets for um, England against Australia um, at Lords. It's not that long ago that you'd wander along the day and, and then buy your tickets. What's happened to all sports, um, the more successful the sport, the more effective this process is, is that the viewer is taken further away from the stadium to the TV screen, from the TV screen through free view onto, pay, onto satellite, from satellite in terms of standard um, commercial packages to packages where you're paying game by game, from satellite packages onto the internet to get the images. Uh, our site is getting further and further away. Um, in lots of ways, that's a, that's a defect, but I also think it creates the possibility <coughs> of this slightly more exciting um, sports journalism, which asks bigger, deeper questions. It asks questions about tactics, as well as just about performance. It asks questions about money. It asks questions about history. Because the people you're looking at on the pitch, or whatever sporting trend is, seem smaller and somehow less exciting. Lots of less writing is doing this. Um, I, know t I was just checking, I was really excited to see and I'd like to be reminded that one of the um, contributors um, to the book is John Foote, who's, who's writing on Calcio and Padlari. I think that the models, talking about Italian football, talking about cycling, the models of how to do it. But I also just wanted to make the point that, um, that if Marx has come to the table of these sorts of discussions, particularly discussions about the economics of sport, then there ought to be things that we can see or can say, which maybe more conventional writers about sport can't say. For example, um, anyone who watches rugby league or rugby union, more league in fact than union, and I'm told um, other similar games, for example Aussie football, for all I know maybe Gaelic football too. If you look at these forms, I think you can even see it in, in other sports too, there's been an immense experience in the last 20 years of, of the um, destruction of skills associated with specific roles. Um, they're being obliterated, and you're seeing more and more performers in terms of sport um, having, in essence, the same body size, the same temperament, the same role. In cricket, you're not going to see uh, the breakdown between, foot, between batsman and bowler disappear altogether, but what you see is no real difference between medium paces, fast and fast bowlers. You see the disappearance of um, you know, such figures as the um, um, Inzaman will hack um, um, body type. You just don't see it in cricket the way that you did 20 or 30 years ago. Now, I think that as Marxists we can come to that and say, look, we've got whole literatures about the destruction of skill in the workplace. Harry Bravman, the um, polarisation of skill at the two extremes, the disappearance of certain roles. We've been talking about some of these things for a long time. We've got something to bring to the conversation which non-Marxist sports writing haven't. Coming back to, to football, um, as a Liverpool fan, the, the dominant things which, which, which my experience my club are all about are about the club's failure to build a decent stadium over 30 years, the strategies they have to get that stadium in the local area, which is essentially to drive out local people by compulsory purchase of the land around the stadium, and the complete failure of a model of, of bringing in um, very, very um, rich, rich capitalist businessmen to sort of buy the club, supposedly to chuck large sums of money and then we look at how they actually finance it it's always about actually them contributing nothing and this model of course replicates itself right around the sporting universe um, again as Marxists we ought to have something to say about the class dynamics there, about the activism sometimes which maybe others miss and the last point on, on to end on is really this um, to my mind the most interesting thing that's going to happen in Marxism this year is that there's a long, slow <coughs> reckoning we need to have with parts of what Marx is writing about in Capital. Um, and, and the number of writers, for example, Lisa Vogel has started to bring this out, the idea that even Capital has within it a concealed architecture beneath the concepts of production and surplus <coughs> value which we're all most familiar with. Even beneath them there are ideas in Marx about, for example, reproduction, social reproduction, the reproduction of generations of workers, which actually underline 
un lie even beneath the concept of base and superstructure, because after all, if you're going to have a working class that's working for capital, that working class must itself first be born and fed and clothed, and where does that come from? That, for me, is, is the most interesting discussion that's happening in contemporary Marxist theory. Apply that now to Marxist writing about sport, and I'd say that we'd start to grasp something else about this lengthening of the gaze of the um, sports viewer. We start to get a sense that actually um, even sporting performance is embodied. It's not just that we see from further away. There's more and more of a disjunction between how we're told people interact with sport and how people actually interact with sport. And this is something that, that I allude to in my chapter in terms of running. Um, the way in which r running as a sporting business is commercialised is through TV companies buying the rights to huge performances such as the Olympics. But the irony is, is that firstly, relatively few people watch the Olympics on TV. Yes, global audience, da, 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 da. But if you look at athletics competitions outside the Olympics, the audiences are in relative terms trivial. And even if you actually look in terms of British athletics um, viewers and watchers, um, the last British sports meet before the Olympics last year was, our, was the, the, the competition where all the athletes who were going to compete in the Olympics were chosen. The number of people watching it over three days in Birmingham was by all accounts fewer than 10,000 people. It was by all accounts, you know, we talk about it, it's the second most important British athletics tracks meet in 50 years. Where's the audience? Fewer than, fewer than 10,000 people. What it reflects is that people don't actually want to watch it. So the question, what, how do people interact with sports then? And another useful statistic, and, 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 and think it's right, between a quarter of a million, sorry, three quarters of a million and a million people in Britain have now run a marathon. If anyone knows run a marathon, how you practice for running a marathon, not you show up as your Jay Goody. You don't show up and run four hours and go home. You practice for it for a three-month period, during which you may easily run something like about a thousand hours to get your body in shape. And so we have this extraordinary um, contradiction that the, for the about a million or so people who will actually watch athletics on TV more than once in their lifetime, the amount of time they'll give to it watching it is about ten hours. But probably those same million people have given, on average, around 500 or 1,000 hours to actually going off and running in a sporting competition. And so there's this extraordinary contradiction between the way that, that, that capitalism, looking for things to sell, tells us we engage with sport, which is as viewers of this commodity further and further away. And our actual experience of it, for those of us who do the sport, um, our prime experience is, is actually doing it. And add to that contradiction, I can hope, and similar contradictions, maybe Marx can make one or two other political points which could um, cause some of the businesses um, um, at least one or two moments of alarm. Okay, thanks very much, David. I thought you were going to claim there that you discovered the hidden <coughs> bit of capital that said Marx was a Liverpool fan, but I'm sure you're not going to find that. Um, so, Hazel Potter, I think, is going to talk about fan culture. Uh, or something like that, but it's entirely up to her, so <laughs> over to you, Hazel. Thank you, Keith. Um, yeah, I'm basically going to talk about the, the development of fan culture in cricket, um, whether one has developed and um, whether there is any future for development. I, I will actually touch on a few of the themes that they've mentioned as well. Um, I think there is quite a lot of crossover, certainly in terms of um, some things that have been written, maybe not um, in the media, but a bit in blogs and so on, and fanzines. So, um, I think one of the things is that the cricket portrays an image that is, is very much a genteel image, certainly um, in the domestic game and in, in this country, um, and it isn't something where you look at it and you think, well, there's a thriving fan culture there, there's, there's the same sort of thing that's grown up in football. Um, most of the time people think of supporters, they think of you know, a couple of old men, maybe a dog sitting there at county cricket. Um, alternatively, the people in blazers drinking champagne in the pavilion at Lords, um, who are probably the other end of the spectrum. Um, so I'm really looking at whether there is anything in between those two extremes that, that is showing any hint of organisation or protest or, or trying to change the status quo in cricket. Um, back in the 80s, when there were football fans first started to organise, um, when fanzines and independent supporters clubs were first seen, um, there was something similar. There were, was evidence of something similar in cricket. Um, there was a very early fanzine, um, which 
and maybe one or two people that remember, which was Johnny Miller, 96 Not Out, um, which probably captured some of the irreverence seen in things like when the <coughs> comes in football. Um, and it did cause um, a bit of a stir in, in certainly within some clubs and within the authorities, and it was banned in certain club shops. Um, unfortunately, it, um, what it didn't do was really create a spark that actually moved to, to really form the, the sort of organisations that were going on in football at the same time. Um, there are quite a lot of reasons, I mean, to, to go into the reasons um, a very high level, the, the domestic cricket really just does not have anywhere near the support that, that football does, either on a day-to-day -day of going to grounds or on TV. Um, and it didn't have, back in the 80s, it didn't have the same crisis that football was, was dealing with. Um, football was dealing with the, the ongoing issue of hooliganism, stadia disasters, and on top of that it had a government that was trying to introduce ID, ID cards and control the fans um, in a way that many felt was just completely unacceptable. And if those issues that, that very much brought football fans together, um, locally and nationally, and, and really started to organise, um, cricket just didn't have the equivalent and it, it very much just at that time once the initial sort of fancies had gone along, it just <coughs> went along quietly, got on with what it was doing, um, didn't really cause much fuss. There were rivalries between clubs, but they weren't anywhere near the rivalries you get in, in football. The, the intensity wasn't there, um, even though the games, you know, they were, they were obviously games that everyone wanted to win, but it, it just wasn't the same in, in that respect. So one of the things that did happen, it's always been the case in cricket, is that counties have been members' clubs. Um, it's something that a lot of football fans um, could only dream of and, and actually if you look at the trust movement now, it's the sort of thing that, that trusts are actually trying to bring back for football clubs. Um, but cricket clubs were set up as, as mutuals and they remained as that. And pretty much the members who, who did own their clubs had very few issues with the committees that were actually running them on a day-to-day -day basis. There was also at the time there, was, there wasn't the money in cricket that there was in football. Um, by the 90s money started pouring into football. Um, but in cricket uh, there was little in the way of TV income. Players very much just went to a club, stayed there for the whole of their career and everything just carried on. And when there was controversy where you had the odd, the odd thing that happened, like Ian Botham and Viv Richards leaving Somerset, um, these days you think of players leaving one club and that would just, you know, it may be a little bit in the newspaper. Back then it became headline news on Grandstand, I believe, and it, it, was, it was a massive event. And at the top of the game, there was the institution that Van had run the game for 200 years, ostensibly still does, the MCC, and, and it was the MCC that very much gave everybody across the world the image of English cricket. It was, it was the bacon and egg blazers, the pavilion, very much an upper class um, elite running the game. Away from the domestic game, at the same time, international cricket was becoming increasingly expensive in England. And back in, I think this is something that they, they uh, touched on prices. In 1985, you could watch a day of an Ashes test at Lords for £6.50. By 1995, prices had, had risen fourfold to £25 or more for a day. And then by 2009, Ashes tickets were upwards of £70, even outside of London. And this year, a day at Lord's would cost you up to £120. And against that backdrop, then a lot of fans started to think about going elsewhere to watch cricket. There was a lure of winter sun. You could watch five days of cricket abroad for the price of one day in the UK. You could get fairly cheap train air travel, and a strong pound meant that once you got there, it was, very cheap, it was also very cheap. Uh, so it's very much the growth of the independent fan, uh, and they became increasingly important to England's cricket sport. And over time, the numbers increased, the noise increased, and suddenly the media started to take notice of this growing group. By 1994-95, there was an Ashes series in Australia, and one Australian newspaper noticed those fans and branded them Barmy. 
um, which was of course one of the many chants that had found its way from the football terraces to cricket grounds abroad. And it inspired some friends to print t-shirts and start selling them to other fans. And that led to a phenomenon that, that you'd say few would have predicted, but the founders, the people that actually printed those t-shirts and sold them at the time, when they came back to the UK in 1995, they immediately set up a limited company called Barmy Army Limited. Um, but nobody else really saw what was going to happen, but it did, it, it, it was something that went from strength to strength. Um, and most of the fans that were involved were pretty much, they didn't really, understand, didn't really know about the whole commercial thing behind it. And it was just, for people that were going on tours, it was very much a grouping for independent travellers, um, people who were fairly like-minded, enjoyed spending time with each other abroad. Um, they'd help each other out with information, they'd go out and drink together, they'd help, if you couldn't find a ticket, somebody would find you a ticket. And perhaps the most important thing was that everyone had somewhere to congregate in a ground together. Um, that helped with the noise, but it also meant that people had some sort of a sense of belonging that wasn't with the tour parties, um, who a lot of them despised. And one of the characteristics of the independent traveller that, that watch England cricket is that they do come from all walks of life. Uh, it's not just um, the people that you'd see in the MCC pavilion, it's very, very few of those on the independent side, but it's people you'll have a builder next to a lawyer, next to um, somebody who's an accountant, any, and people from every single walk of life are there. Um, but the one thing they do have in common is that they do prefer sitting around in t-shirt and shorts rather than blazers and red trousers. Few of those who positioned themselves with the Barmy Army early on had any desire to be anything more than that loose group of independent travellers. But as the movement grew, it also became a lot more formal. Memberships were introduced first of all, and merchandising grew to the extent that it was not that long before it was being sold in official outlets in grounds rather than out of a bag behind somebody's chair. And then the most controversial thing that happened was that the Barmy Army started actually running tours itself. <coughs> The one thing that independent fans always had as a butt of their jokes were the, were the organised tour groups. They were the people that turned up in matching polo shirts, branded polo shirts. They paid a huge amount more than anyone who organised their own trip. And they would get called, there was, there's a group, Gulliver, Gulliver Sports, um, who organised tours. The people that with them were commonly just known as Gullibles purely for the fact that they would pay so much money um, for their own experience. And so when the Barmy Army, which was the self-professed champion of independent fans, started to run tours, it actually led to lo it losing quite a lot of support. It had its own areas of the cricket grounds now reserved exclusively for its tours, its tour groups, which was the antithesis of the, the, the ethos that it was built around the communal areas for independent travellers to congregate in. And even worse, some of those tour groups, some of those blazers suddenly wanted in on the action. They wanted to be seen, to be photographed with what they saw was the famous Barmy Army. <coughs> and in probably not more than 10 years, it had become part of the establishment that so many of the, the independent fans really hated. It would probably be wrong to say that the Barmy Army's founders, who, who were at this point down to a single director, um, but had sold out because they'd never really laid claim to being a political or campaigning organisation. Um, and the early formalisation into a limited company and swift trademarking of logos, uh, which also happened back in 1995, hinted at the commercial approach that they'd had from the outset. But even so, it, they were still the closest thing that a lot of fans saw to having a voice, to, to representing them as, as independent supporters. Those who ran the organisation also started to spend quite a lot of time schmoozing with the officials from either the ECB or um, the cricket board of the, the, the country that they were travelling in at the time. And that helped to ensure home test tickets for, for its paid up members, but they weren't necessarily at prices anyone could afford. Of course there are, there are good aspects as well, but the Barmy Army has always um, supported charities at home and overseas. It's got a Colts programme which is absolutely, which is really key in actually getting young people into playing cricket. And when there have been issues abroad, it has stood up for fans 
Uh, and in 2012, there was an issue in Sri Lanka where the cricket board decided that there were a lot of England fans going to watch the games, um, and there always were. So what they do is they hike the prices up to £25 a day, which in the context of prices here doesn't sound a huge amount. But the most they'd ever charged for a day's cricket before in, in Sri Lanka was £5, and that was for the very expensive seats, not to stand on a bank. Um, and they also decided they'd segregate home and away fans, um, which is something that, that if you go as an independent supporter, you, you actually want to actually spend time talking to people from the country you're visiting. Um, there were a lot of fans that a lot of pleas put into the ECB who just completely ignored them all. And the Barmy Army did try to neg negotiate. Um, they were unsuccessful, but they did then try to help fans get into ground. <coughs> Uh, the failure of the ECB to acknowledge those difficulties and the appalling treatment of the fans in, in Sri Lanka led to the chairman, Giles Clark, who's a multi-millionaire, getting booed at the final presentation. And it really highlights the need for some sort of a fans-led organisation to be there to help people in, in, in the face of little support from the official bodies. Back, at, back in the UK, it's, it's almost as if that fan culture which started has come full circle. The Barmy Army has a huge, a, a, a very high profile, but it's not, and, and it's pretty certain that it will never be a campaigning group. And while attempts have been made to start something along the lines more of a, a cricketing version of the Football Supporters Federation, nothing has ever actually materialised. But arguably, I'd say that there's, at the moment, there's probably no, no more time than when cricket is really needed an organisation to, to campaign for it. There's a lot of issues that affect fans, but there's very little opportunity for anyone to debate them. First of all, you have the ECB selling off rights to test matches, so that they're now purely available on pay TV. And that, that's removed one of the really crucial ways, re types of media for people to get interested in the game. And then, alongside that, there's bidding for international matches, uh, which is another ECB initiative which has led to both price increases and financial trouble for some of the counties. What they have to do is every single county has to put in bids to host a test match. So people have seen that these are possibly lucrative, they've bid higher and higher, and at the end of the day what's happened is that some of them have actually ended up not being lucrative at all and brought those counties um, almost to their knees. At the same time, the cost of watching tests has risen, uh, partly because the clubs are trying to regain that outlay that they've made and to pay for the redevelopments that they've needed to put in place to actually host the games as well. But as long as those games sell out, and as we saw this year, though most of those Ashes tests could sell out twice over, the ECB has absolutely no interest in changing the system. And it's not only the cost that's worrying. Um, one of the related things to that is if you go to a ground at a popular test and look around, then the demographic <laughs> is very much largely males over the age of around 25. If you go to a similar test in another country, there'll be way more families, groups of teenagers, and far more children. So while the tickets are being sold now in England, where's English cricket's next generation of fans going to come from? Meanwhile, the influx of Murdoch cash has really helped to fuel uh, the sharp rises in players' wages that were with, have been withstood for a very long time. And alongside that, a more, a, a more active transfer sy system has emerged. And each of these are issues where fans really need, do need a voice. Another <coughs> development at county level, there are two clubs, Hampshire and Yorkshire, which have already abandoned their IPS status to lure in venture capital, a move lauded by some, notably those who work for Sky, um, which ultimately landed both of them in crisis. And there's a lesson to be learned there, but it's easy to see it within the current structure how others could be tempted. And one of the things that, that possibly isn't understood as much as it should be is that supporters really need to, to see the importance and strength they have in being members of a mutual. And county fans have also seen a number of ill-judged attempts to restructure the county season with, with very little consultation of supporters. Uh, 2020 cricket, which... Uh, was mentioned earlier, has, has, has been an absolute game changer here. It, it's been very much marketed to certain groups um, and it has become the most popular format, format of cricket to emerge in years. And as such, the authorities have, have wanted to capitalise on that. But the issue 
for, for fans is that they've done so without consulting the county members who are very much the stalwart of the game. It's also led, it's led to calls for the ECB to listen to fans as well as sponsors. And there has been a small amount of lip service paid to consultation, but most of the time there is absolutely minimal, minimal contact between the governing body and the fans. In the space of a decade and a half, it could probably be said that county cricket has gone from a fairly stable position to a far more precarious state. And while the game remains a long way from the excesses of football, there is plenty to worry about and corporate interests are increasingly important. County finances too are a real area of concern and it, it, it seems that there are constantly two or three counties who are very close to the brink. And if one of those does ever go, then there will be more and more calls for the number of professional teams to be reduced. The question that I asked at the beginning was whether there was a, had been a, a fan culture had developed. Uh, and I think it, it has to a certain extent, but whether the domestic fan can really be galvanised into action remains to be seen. But with the, the, the governing body, the ECB, is hardly likely to do anything in the interest of the average supporter. So I'd say that it's only organisation that can really make a difference. And if there is another stage in fan culture to follow, then it's probably the most important of all. Okay, thanks very much, Hazel. <coughs> um, moving over now to uh, Gareth Edwards, who I think is going to speak on Portsmouth, is it? Almost, almost. Almost Portsmouth, um, okay. Well, Where first of Thanks, Keith, for the invitation to come and speak today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be one of those people that doesn't talk about the chapters that I have, really have in the book. Uh, uh, I was asked if I would talk a little about a current project that I'm working on. So I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, a footballer called Lindy Delapena. Uh, and the reason that I've chosen this over some, some of the other stuff that I've been doing lately uh, is because this isn't just about historical curiosity for me, that, that actually this, uh, this project arose out of political activism as much as anything else. Um, about two months ago, we had, our, uh, we had the EDL, the English Defence League, march through Portsmouth for the fourth time in three years. Uh, they always seem to pick the summer holidays for some reason. Uh, I really should be on the beach with an ice cream, but instead we were organising a, a counter-demonstration in Portsmouth. Uh, one of the things that I thought uh, that I would do in the run-up to this was write a little bit about Portsmouth's history as quite a cosmopolitan city, as, uh, as a place where there's a long tradition of anti-fascism. And going back through uh, some of the council-produced booklets uh, that the museum hold, I came across the name Linda Del Pena. Uh, and it struck me that I'd never heard of this guy. And it's important, uh, especially someone I've, I've lived in Portsmouth all my life, 34 years. Uh, it's interesting that I've never come across this guy because Lindy Delapena was, was a trailblazer. He was the first Jamaican to play top flight football uh, in this country. He was uh, the first black player to play for a championship winning team. And most importantly, in the context of the EDL marching through Portsmouth, this guy was the first black player to play for Portsmouth. Uh, and played uh, just after the Second World War. So, uh, I'll say a little bit about Lindy, about his, his time at Portsmouth, and then pose something of a question at the end. Uh, I should say that this is a kind of pet project, I've only been doing it a couple of months, so it's not fully worked out. There's lots of ifs and buts, and actually, uh, if people want to uh, sort of chip in uh, with any thoughts in the discussion, yeah, you're more than welcome. So, uh, Lloyd Lindbergh Delapena, or affectionately known as Lindy, uh, was born in Kingston, uh, in Jamaica, in uh, May 1927. He's an exceptionally talented, uh, prodigious schoolboy athlete. Represents the, uh, his school at, amongst other things, tennis, football, cricket, mm. athletics, hockey, uh, and I probably miss half a dozen other things as well. Uh, he, his sports master at the school says, uh, look, son, uh, Let's face it, you're never going to be an academic or an accountant or any of these things. Why don't you try your luck uh, as a professional footballer in England? Uh, and at the age of 18, his parents pay £40 to get him on a ship that's transporting POWs back uh, from Japan. Uh, and he ends up in England in November 1945. Uh, he has a trial at Arsenal, fails unfortunately, uh, and as a uh, 
well, well depends on whether or not you're an Arsenal fan, I suppose. Uh, fortunately, uh, fails at Arsenal, maybe. Uh, fails at Arsenal and doesn't see any other choice but to enlist in the army, and he's posted out to Egypt uh, with the Royal Fusiliers, where he spends two years, uh, and gets quite a name for himself, playing cricket, playing football in the army, manages to run 10.1 for the 100 yards, which seems exceptional, uh, especially since the, uh, the guy's my height, 5'7", and you think, running that quick, he must be about 6'9", or something, but an uh, um, unbelievable athlete. <coughs> it's suggested while he's over there that when he returns to England, he tries his luck at Chelsea or Portsmouth. Uh, tries Portsmouth first up. Uh, and he comes back to a Portsmouth that's uh, not surprisingly still feeling the ravages of war. Uh, there's most of the uh, city is still in a state of devastation. If you ask any local historian about the devastation of the Second World War in Portsmouth, they will point out that 120 pubs were destroyed uh, in a city that claimed to have more pubs per square mile than any other city in all of Europe. Uh, then they'll talk about loss of life, destruction, shipyards and what have you. But it, there, there was a, of course it was a huge wreckage. Uh, in, as late as 1950, they're still petitioning the government for money to rebuild the two shopping precincts in the city, uh, uh, to no avail as it happens. Uh, and there's a massive enthusiasm for the game of football. So Lindy joins the club, which is uh, week in, week out, getting 44,000, packing out Fratton Park. 44,000 supporters in Fratton Park. Uh, out of a population of about uh, 230,000. So about one-fifth, uh, just under one-fifth, of the city is turning up week in, week out to come and watch Poppy play. Uh, and give you an, uh, a comparison, <coughs> Uh, you're going to have to excuse me as I ill my way through this. Uh, give you a comparison. 20 years earlier, <coughs> when Portsmouth were topping the league table, the, uh, the average attendance was just under 20,000 people. So there's this huge appetite for ex uh, excitement, entertainment, uh, some sort of escape, uh, and people going to the football a lot. So Lindy signs uh, at half time in his trial game. Uh, the Pompey manager, Bob Jackson, sees him score a goal and says, right, that's it, we'll have you. Or so the story goes uh, at half time. Uh, but his, uh, his opportunities are restricted to play for Portsmouth. Uh, much of this has to do with the, the way the contemporary game operates at that time. So unlike now, with uh, with a squad system and what have you, uh, with seven substitutes, the chances are you might get a game sooner or later. Uh, there are no subs. Uh, pretty much all of Portsmouth's players are playing week in, week out. Uh, so he, <coughs> he gets no opportunity uh, in the, the end of the 47-48 season. Comes back in the 48-49 season, has, has an astounding start in the reserves. It suddenly becomes uh, something uh, of a prolific striker. I should, should say, Lindy is one of those wonderful multi-talented people that played, played outside right, inside right, or up front by himself. Uh, and he, he goes into the reserves. And he's, he's got four in two games, and there's a wonderful piece in the local paper that says, uh, Della Payne's first goal uh, was scored after he hit it so hard that the Chelsea reserve goalkeeper tried to catch it, but ended up in the net with him. Uh, it, the, the guy is seriously talented. Okay. <laughs> uh, and this is where it gets a bit confusing, because actually if you look at anyone that mentions Linda Della Payne, uh, nobody seems to get how much he plays and how much he doesn't play, how many goals he scores, of course. Uh, give you an example. I have here, colouring over the white line, the history of black footballers in Britain by uh, Phil Vassley. If nobody's read it, you really should, because it, it's a fantastic book, but manages to get the amount of games that Lindy plays wrong. Uh, but it's not the only one here. I, there are no sources that I've found, uh, printed and published, that, that get, get it correct. <coughs> the truth is that Lindy only plays eight games for, the, for Portsmouth over the course of two seasons, in the 48-49 season, 49-50. Plays one in the first season, and he plays the rest in the second. Uh, why is this? Well, partly it's because he has a terrible time with injuries. He turns in a man of the match performance against Middlesbrough in his second season, and he pulls up with a hamstring injury, and they stick him out on the right wing. Uh, 
he was unbelievable in that game. So much so that Middlesbrough tried to sign him and eventually did sign him at the end of the season on that performance. But he, this recurs quite a lot. He misses large chunks of the season all the time uh, because of the amount of injuries he suffers. Second thing is that, uh, unfortunately for him, Portsmouth are in their golden span as a club. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I do say the golden spat. There, there is no second one that I'm going to allude to later on. Uh, <laughs> let's have a look. The uh, see if I can't. No, that won't let me. Right, I'll have to read it off of here. Uh, there is uh, give you an idea of just how good this Pompey team were. Uh, they won back-to-back championships in the 48, 49, 49, 50 seasons, uh, and. Uh, there's, don't know if people have come across him, uh, unfortunately uh, died a couple of years ago, but a uh, sports historian called uh, Jim Reardon, who was in the Communist Party all his life, uh, is a Pompey boy born and bred, and was on the terraces as a, I think, 10 year old back in, back in those seasons. And if I could find the quote, uh, very quickly, uh, after, the, after the war was over and the regular season resumed, the glory years for Portsmouth FC began. They were high times to be a fan. Uh, we, were, we were to become one of the greatest teams, if not the greatest in the world. Pompey were full of exciting players and we won the first division two years running in 1949-1950. Uh, it was an incredible team. You go through the likes of Peter Harris and Ike Clark and Jimmy Dickinson. These are people that will spend probably 10 years of their career all, all on the south coast, making 400 odd appearances, uh, playing unbelievable football. Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately for Lindy, it didn't really matter how good he was, he just wasn't going to get into that team. Uh, and just as a, a last piece about him, uh, the, he only scores one goal for the club, and he scores it in 1950, January 1950, in a third round game between Portsmouth, uh, third, third round of the FA Cup, uh, Portsmouth versus Norwich. And uh, it's a 1 1 draw. Norwich are two leagues lower than Pompey. And <coughs> the next day, you think, my God, they're going to go to town, aren't they? It's not a good result. But fantastic. Lindy Dallapena scored. A whole, literally this size piece of paper uh, is devoted to a match report, uh, which not once mentions Lindy, not once, not once mentions his goal. Uh, it does, however, uh, talk of the mistaken tactics, the useless pattern weaving, and the fact that Portsmouth had no initiative on the day. Uh, it, in fact, it even goes on to say how uh, they, they mention the game receipts. Uh, if anyone's interest, interested, £3,503 they made that day. But nobody mentions that Lindy scores a goal. And then <laughs> the next day, uh, and I will we'll see if I can find this one. Uh, the next day, they, they, they have another story on the sports page about the replay. And they do mention Lindy this time. Uh, sorry, I've got so many quotes here, it's unbelievable. Uh, No, we're going to have to do without. Uh, it mentions that Lindy's actually got an injury. Again, he's picked up an injury. He scores a goal, picks up an injury. So he's not going to play. And then it says that actually his goal was fairly debatable anyway against Norwich. And then it says that the pe- person that's going to replace him, Dougie Reed, uh, has a knack of coming in after, after missing the game or two and scoring the winning goals. So the local paper's coverage of Lindy's only ever goal for Portsmouth is Ha ha, you're injured, wasn't a goal anyway. And by the way, your replacement's much better than you. Uh, to add in, <laughs> insult to his injury, Dougie Reed comes in the following day and scores both goals. Pompey beat Norwich 2-0. Uh, <coughs> uh, Lindy then goes off at the end of the season, has a remarkable career at Middlesbrough, uh, where he's plays 290 odd games. Uh, best friends, Brian Clough, who eventually gets him out of the team, uh, by being such a prolific player himself uh, and retires away to Jamaica where he still lives today uh, and th- this is where the politics kick in because the one thing that you notice when you look at Delapena's time on the south coast and I wasn't expecting it, when I looked through his life I was expecting some sort of right let's see how he deals with adversity deals with the racism that's thrown in the one thing you notice is a surprising lack of racism uh, now don't get me wrong it's not that 
There is none. I'm certainly not making that case that he suffers. But <laughs> you look at his statements, and he says, I, the, I didn't suffer a particularly large amount of racism. Uh, you look through the Portsmouth uh, Evening News, the paper at the time, uh, or to put it in context, if you imagine the way that people like uh, Walter Tull, Arthur Wharton were treated before the first world war, black, pioneering black footballers in this country, or how people uh, that came after, uh, like uh, he says, losing everyone. Uh, Best, who was that? Lord Clyde. George. The, yeah, Clyde, sorry. Lord. Uh, too, many, too many names and dates and places in my head. What do you think about the systematic racist abuse? that Clyde Best faced, all the other black players that came after in the 70s and 80s. Lindy, Lindy doesn't suffer to that extent. Uh, yeah, whereas uh, people like Wharton and Tull were constantly described in terms of their skin colour and berated from the, uh, in, in, in uh, local papers and berated from the stands by fans, you read through it, I've uh, got some quotes from the paper, and I've been through all of the papers from that time, read, reading the reports. Uh, Dalafina impresses. He gets a, a big ovation from the crowd. Uh, Dalapino was a great, uh, was a success in his first appearance. He had the crowd with him all the way. Uh, and so you think, well, is, is this sort of specific uh, to Lindy? Uh, and it really isn't. Uh, at that time, uh, there are a number of uh, black people that were in Portsmouth, and there. Uh, the City Museum has collated all sorts of oral histories from people. And time and again, they, they talk about how actually they felt strange, and this was strange, they said cohesion, it was very good actually. Portsmouth, <coughs> life in Portsmouth wasn't uh, chock full of racism. Uh, in 1950, 49 Bermudans turned up to have apprenticeships in the dockyard. And let's see if I can find that one. Uh, at the time, 15-year-old Mickey Scotland, one of the Bermudians that arrived, we really did mingle in just like we were born here, I would say we were just like average English guys. Time and time again you find this. Now, why? Let, let's assume that this is correct. Why is this the case? Lindy uh, says himself that he thinks it's because he has a fairly light skin colour for a black man. Now, I don't maybe, but I don't think that explains it. I don't think that's a good enough way of explaining it. Uh, so let's race through very, very quickly just a few possibilities. One thing is that the Portsmouth has been a cosmopolitan city for a long time. Uh, there's a Jewish community established in the 1800s. Uh, Polish and Spanish immigrant communities arrive as refugees in 1834. By the middle of the 19th century, there's a huge, uh, large, comparatively large Irish community in the city. Uh, all of these things give a kind of cosmopolitan feel. Uh, so there's the possibility that, that that's uh, the case. Secondly, actually Portsmouth has, uh, had, at that time, seen quite a lot of black sports people. Uh, some of these examples aren't without problems. For example, they, they, there were a number of uh, black versus white uh, boxing contests, which obviously are underpinned by that whole great white hope thing that comes out of Jack Johnson's heavyweight title win in 1906 or whatever it is. Uh, but there have been other things, uh, other occasions. So naval ratings that had come from Pakistan are giving uh, performances of, of dance and gymnastics. This is reported by the paper. <coughs> uh, the uh, what's the other one? Oh, in 1948, there was uh, at the Pitt Street Gym, a gym right in the centre of the city, a whole number of. Uh, uh, people turned up to watch uh, an athletics meet between the, the Navy, the Army and the London Athletics Club. The London Athle Athletics Club had their numbers boosted on that day by members of the Nigerian Olympic squad. So there, there are examples of black athletes in Portsmouth all the time. Uh, lastly, there, there's some evidence, again from the oral histories that are, are done by Portsmouth Museum, uh, that the fact that black GIs were stationed in Portsmouth uh, during the Second World War might have had an influence on this. Uh, it would, people note very early on that the black GIs don't have the same sort of money or the same sort of status as the white American soldiers that are stationed in the city. <coughs> and get sympathy from the large number. The, I'll, I'll give you just one quote, but this is a... Uh, uh, will give you a flavour of what many people were saying, what uh, 
many kind of quotes that you can find. Uh, Les Ford was a schoolboy during the Second World War. Uh, when we first saw these black Americans, we were in awe. The first black people we'd ever seen. Uh, when I say we, I'm talking like of myself and, you know, immediate contemporaries. It's the first black people we'd ever, uh, we'd ever seen like this. Uh, they were all right. They were all right. They never had the kind of money that white Americans had. So there are all sorts of local things that go into the mix. But I don't think that that's enough. I don't think you can explain uh, everything in kind of Portsmouth exceptionalism way. Uh, especially because Lindy talks about his time at Middlesbrough. And he says again that he doesn't su suffer the same racism uh, that he sees later footballers have. Or people that have gone before. And I wonder just how much... And this is where uh, <laughs> my, my uh, research hits a question. It was rather punctuated by it, in fact, that... Why? Why this relative lack of racism? Uh, and I'll just give you the last one and then sum up very quickly. Uh, <coughs> implicit in Phil's book uh, is an idea that uh, actually because of the way uh, the ruling class desperately needed more people to come in after the Second World War, they needed the labour, they needed uh, people as a kind of cheap resource to help rebuild the country, that there's uh, the, the political class take uh, a kind of lenient view all of a sudden about aliens, about immigrants, uh, that uh, they can actually be a good thing rather than just a card that can be played when you make a, want, want to make a political point. And I wonder how, to what extent, that, that's a hypothesis which I think has all sorts of problems, but is, is an interesting one and goes some way to explain why Lindy doesn't suffer so much racism. Uh, that there is a small window where those ideas aren't quite as dominant in the ruling class and therefore not quite as dominant in the rest of society. But it's, uh, I'll, I'll leave it with people if they have any views on that. But the, the, the last one I would say is, uh, Lindy is important. In 2008, when P Portsmouth won the FA Cup, on the, at the starting 11 that day, eight out of the 11 footballers that started on the pitch were black. When they won and then did the tour on the open top bus, as, as is compulsory these days, something like 10,000 people were out on the streets of Portsmouth. And they cheered and they screamed and they shouted and they were so happy. And for anti racists, it was a wonderful day. For, for the racists, not so much. Good. But I tell you what, for most of those 10,000 people, they didn't give a damn about the colour of their skin. And that's the fact that we're at that point is testament to the fact that people like Lindy. I've been playing football uh, 50, 60 years early. I'll leave it up. Thanks very much, uh, Gareth. I know you, you blog on sport at Inside Left blog, so I'm sure there's lots more uh, that we'll be hearing. Uh, um, presumably you're going to aim to publish this or...? Yes, yes, Hopefully. Uh, maybe. <laughs> okay. um, well, I'm just going to speak briefly now and then we'll move over to some uh, questions and, and uh, discussion. Um, my chapter in the book is about uh, 1963 and the uh, change from uh, gentlemen um, and uh, players in cricket, am professionals and amateurs essentially, um, and the introduction of uh, the, the Gillette Cup, um, which introduced uh, sponsorship and payment, which made the division uh, impossible to sustain at least um, at a sort of theoretical level. I'm not really going to talk a great deal uh, about that. I'm going to go back a um, hundred years before and then we'll, we'll get back to 1963, but not by visiting each year uh, in between, otherwise we'll be here until midnight. Um, but uh, I'm sure it won't have escaped the attention of anybody here that uh, this week is the 150th anniversary of the Football Association, which was founded um, just down the road uh, in Covent Garden on the 26th of October 1863. Uh, no doubt we'll hear a bit more about that in the media later uh, in the week. Um, and CLR James, um, in his book Beyond the Boundary, um, which we sort of had a ramble around in a seminar in the spring, um, talks about, of course, the 1860s as the period um, when um, both organised sport um, and uh, organisations of working people start to develop uh, and draws a kind of link or a parallel between the two because of course you've got 1868 uh, the, the, the formation of the trade union 
<coughs> Congress, um, another event in 1863, perhaps slightly less noteworthy um, the FA was the formation of the Yorkshire County Cricket Club uh, on the 8th of January at the Adelphi Hotel in Sheffield. Um, and uh, on the 4th of June, very pertinent um, for somebody immediately to my uh, left here, um, the Eton Boating Song was first performed. We don't need to have another rendition at this immediate moment. Um, so, uh, you know, there was, it, was, it was an interesting um, kind of year um, for, for sport, both 1863 and of course in 1864, uh, the formation of the International Working Men's Association, the first uh, international. So that kind of period, this is what James is arguing uh, of, of the 1860s, um, has that link between organised sport and organised labour uh, and organised labour politics developing at the same time, which is an interesting parallel and there was lots more that could be perhaps said about that. Uh, suffice to say, however, that actually hasn't been said, uh, and I'm not about to to say it uh, now um, because uh, it would require more research. What I would, do want to do is just look at a sort of um, an interesting sort of thing that I've partly covered um, on my blog. If anybody ever bothers to to read it, um, but it's pertinent here, um, which is looking at that period um, and looking at links between John Wisdom. Uh, because of course it's the 150th anniversary of the first publication of the Cricketers' Almanac, Wisden. Um, Karl Marx, Henry Myers Hibman, who was the founder of the Social Democratic Federation, um, its first Marxist party, and also played first-class cricket for Sussex and the MCC. Uh, and I think we might mention uh, Brighton as well, um, just to sort of have complete uh, sort of unusual links. Um, so. 1864, um, June 1864, the, the MCC legalises over on bowling, in effect therefore starting the modern uh, game of cricket. We've got the publication uh, of Wisden, um, and John Wisden, who was born in Brighton on the 5th of September 1826, made his first class debut for Sussex as a fast bowler in 1845. His final game for Sussex was against the MCC at the Royal Brunswick Ground in Hove on the 17th, 18th and 19th of August 1863. And he had in the first innings the credible figures of 2 for 35 in 29 overs uh, in a drawn game. Um, he then went on, of course, to launch the, the Cricketers uh, Almanac. The following year, 1864, uh, a young gentleman, the son of a businessman born in London in 1842, uh, an old Etonian, Henry Myers Hinman, made his debut for Sussex. Hinman played 13 matches as a right hand back for Cambridge University, MCC, and Sussex in 1864 and 1865. On the 30th of June 1864 at the Oval, Hinman turned out for the Gentlemen of the South against the Players of the South. It's a point I made earlier about the abolition in 1963. Batting well down the order in both innings made 4 and 11. Not very successful <coughs> on that occasion. However, playing for Sussex against Hampshire at Hove on the 11th to the 13th of August 1864, Hinman did better, scoring 58 before being run out in a match that Sussex won by 10 wickets. And a few days later, also at Hove, uh, he scored 6 and 62 uh, for Sussex against Middlesex. Uh, it was some years before Hinman discovered the works of Karl Marx, um, around about 20, uh, in fact, possibly slightly fewer. Um, but Marx himself was familiar with Brighton in the, in the 1860s. His daughter, Eleanor Marx, uh, had taken a teaching post in the town, uh, and he visited from time to time, uh, amazingly enough, for his health. Uh, Marx was a fan of Margate, and described Brighton as this sea bathing place. Um, I think it would be no more than historical speculation to argue that Marx, John Wisden and Hinman could have bumped into each other on Brighton Seafront in the 1860s. Uh, and Marx certainly knew nothing um, of cricket, although the three would of course immediately recognise each other by the fact they all had beards. Um, looking slightly beyond the historical moment of 1864, um, however, that it raises the question uh, of Marxism cricket and that really is dealt with 
probably preeminently in C.L.R. James's book Beyond the Boundary. It's the 50th anniversary of the publication uh, of that book uh, this year. Um, and uh, John Arlott, uh, the great cricket um, commentator and writer, um, wrote it's the, it was the finest book written about the game uh, of cricket. Uh, James, of course, aside from being uh, a cricket correspondent of the Manchester Guardian, um, played cricket himself, a leading figure in the fight for West Indian uh, independence, was also uh, a Trotskyist theorist uh, and activist. Um, so he had a very wide range uh, of interests. Um, he did not, however, have a beard, uh, and his connections with Brighton are uncertain. So that's where the analogy breaks down. Um, but he, <coughs> moving on the hundred years to that 1963 period, touching very briefly on the chapter that I've got in the book, um, that gentleman versus players era, uh, which had dominated right from the beginnings uh, of the game um, was uh, 50 years ago it went but uh, that of course was also the year that Sir Alec Douglas whom old Etonian and former uh, first class cricketer became leader of the Tory party uh, and lost only narrowly uh, to Harold Wilson uh, in the October 8, 1964 um, election so cricket sort of belatedly entered the 20th century in 1963, uh, but it was still a few years before the players' union, the PCA, was able to get going effectively in 1968, roughly speaking. Um, and, and the interesting thing is, and I've been having a look around while sort of doing similar publicity for it and so on, the number of cricketers identified in any way with the political left seems to be tiny. Um, the impact and influence of anti-imperialist politics is without question. The example of the West Indian cricket side um, is key uh, in that respect, and anti-racism and so on. That is definitely uh, a significant feature, and that, of course, um, in a sense, is where some of C.L.R. James's impact and work uh, comes from. Um, but when we're looking um, for uh, cricketers on the left, it's possible, I think, to make some kind of case for Gladman. Uh, C.L.R. James uh, disliked uh, best Bradman, mm. um, which makes it even more puzzling that Norman Garassi, who we were talking about before the seminar started, was a great fan of Bradman, um, uh, uh, since they both came from the same kind of Trotskyist tradition, broadly uh, speaking, and there may have been some kind of uh, internecine point there, which I, I can't quite put my finger on. But Bradman certainly uh, was took quite a hard line against uh, anti-apartheid when he was an administrator, against apartheid, uh, when he was an administrator in Australian cricket. Uh, and he met Vorster uh, and made it pretty plain that uh, he felt that the whole apartheid system was a bomb. Um, quite an interesting kind of uh, position to, to take, I think, uh, quite an unusual one. Mike Brearley, um, England captain um, for a period, um, Again, was I think well known for being broadly on the left. Certainly, um, was one of the uh, supporters of the anti-Nazi league in the 1970s, um, which was quite unusual for uh, a cricketer. Um, football was less unusual. Mm. Um, and the other player who stands out uh, was the England fast bowler Tom Cartwright, um, who played for Warwickshire um, and um, was very much tied up with the Basil de Oliveira. Um, issue in 1968. Um, Cartwright was always uh, on the left and I suspect, and again it's very difficult to find out about this, he's at, he was actually uh, worked at Roots Car Factory in Coventry uh, and I suspect that he was either uh, in the Communist Party or certainly around it um, from that period um, and that probably explains uh, his, his politics but again very, very unusual in terms of uh, English cricket. So. Yeah, the point there is, if you look back to that 1963 um, period, the, the game does move forward. It finally drags itself away from this absurd division between amateurs uh, and professionals, where the amateurs had separate pavilions uh, for a long time, um, and the, the gentlemen and players only actually met when they walked out uh, onto the pitch. Otherwise, they did not mix because they were two separate classes of people. Um, they got rid of that in 1963, but uh, you know, in many ways. Uh, the top of the 
game remains um, very kind of uh, right wing would be a, 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 a sort of poor way to put it, but a very traditional conservative with a small c um, kind of um, game in a way that some other sports um, arguably haven't. Um, and that I think is an issue um, in terms of the fan base that was talked about earlier uh, in England. Less so clearly um, elsewhere in the world because their cricket, particularly with the anti-imperialist um, dimensions and so on that have grown up in, in, in a number of countries, has got a, a rather different kind of um, perspective um, to that um, which exists um, in England. However, yeah, there's a lot more that can be said about that. That was really just um, something that uh, I thought I would sort of uh, throw in there just in case we didn't have enough speakers, but we did have.